This year, of course, 2020 is the 400th anniversary of the arrival of the Mayflower. And so there's been a lot of work being done on the pilgrims and their world. And one of the best and most insightful books of those that are being produced uh, is by our guest today, John Turner. John is a professor of religious studies at George Mason University. And his new book is They Knew They Were Pilgrims, Plymouth Colony, and the Contest for American Liberty. Uh, John, welcome. And I wonder if you can start out by briefly telling us uh, what the book is about and what, what you see as the distinguishing features. Sure, thanks, Frank. I'm really pleased to, to appear and talk to people connected with the Congregational Library, uh, which is such a wonderful institution and, and archive. Well, first of all, you know, I think the Mayflower story uh, has appealed to me in part because it is so contested uh, that you have, you know, people coming at it with really diametrically opposed points of view. Uh, some people who really venerate uh, the pilgrims and, uh, you know, lionize them as major contributors to the story of political and religious liberty in what became the United States. And then on the other hand, um, especially um, on a more popular level, I'd say over the last 50 years, it's been a lot of reassessment and uh, critique of the pilgrims as one wave of invaders who uh, dispossessed the natives of their land and, and killed those who resisted. So the story appealed to me in part because it matters to a lot of people. And so it's important for us uh, to regularly take a fresh look at it, try to, try to get it um, uh, understood as accurately as possible, and try to have some sense of the way things uh, seemed to those who lived through it. Uh, which is a really tough task uh, for us to do, especially with the native half of the story. Uh, the other thing I'd say is that for all of the attention placed on the Mayflower, the Compact, the December 1620 landing at Plymouth, the treaty in uh, the, the next, uh, late the next winter, uh, and then the first Thanksgiving, People don't pay a lot of attention to Plymouth Colony after 1621, certainly not after uh, 1620, when things really get going um, with the Massachusetts Bay Colony. And I found that there's just this rich, longer, uh, relatively little known history of Plymouth Colony that was incredibly fun for me to explore and write about. You might have touched upon this or implied this already, but uh, you've written an award-winning biography of Brigham Young. You've written about the crusade for Christ in the 1950s. Um, this seems like a totally new area for you. What, what drew you to it particularly? Sure. Well, it's probably not a really good idea to always be trying to learn new things, but, but maybe it is. I, I sort of like that because then the research uh, really becomes a way for me to learn about a new place, time, and people. But the, the, you know, there were some themes that, that really attracted me to this story that also connected with um, the books that I've written about the Latter-day Saints. Uh, those include a concern for what constitutes a true church um, and a corresponding concern about alleged apostasy in other churches um, religious persecution, um, the establishment of um, new, um, you know, unions of sort of church and state, uh, an exodus uh, of a people from, from one place to somewhere else, uh, and, you know, similar conflicts uh, with peoples who already occupied um, that new land. So there were, there were actually a lot of, a lot of points of connection uh, between this story and the story of the Latter-day Saints in the 19th century. Uh, but at the same time, I mean, history, we, if, you, if you study a new century in a new place, it's always a great reminder that people think really differently um, about the world at different times and places. And um, I, I like that challenge. Uh, 
Um, and I also find that just that's a fundamentally important reminder about human beings. It's interesting. I, I empathize with the idea of, of uh, going into something new. I think in, in many ways, some of my best uh, experiences in teaching in the years before I retired was when I was asked to teach a course on something that I knew very little about. Uh, and just getting into it and, and learning about it uh, was, was a, a wonderful experience. What, going into Plymouth, and you, you talked earlier about how uh, there have been different views of the uh, Pilgrims and the Mayflower story and so forth. Uh, what surprised you most about what you found in the story? Sure. Well, that's a that's a great uh, that's a good question. A uh, lot of surprises uh, along the way. Yeah, and, and part of this uh, th these aren't necessarily new discoveries. So, some of these were just new discoveries to me. I mean, the Mayflower passengers are just about the most studied group of people um, out there, and um, you know the patient. Um, combing of archives in England has unearthed so much um, about them. I was really taken uh, with Robert Cushman, who ended up not ultimately being a Mayflower passenger. Uh, he ended up staying uh, behind in England after the uh, Speedwell had to be abandoned. But I found him such a fascinating character. And one could learn a lot about his life between 1600 and 1620 and sort of trace the steps that led him uh, to definitively reject uh, the Church of England, which maybe began in part as sort of some youthful capers, uh, but then also involved some theological questions, uh, ultimately led him to uh, the Dutch city of Leiden and then ultimately brought him briefly uh, to Plymouth Colony in 1621, where he delivers a remarkable uh, sermon uh, that is published um, and gets very little attention compared to uh, John Winthrop's model of Christian charity, but in many ways is just as profound and, and poignant. Um, so, you know, episodes like that, um, I really relished becoming acquainted with. And then moving into the later uh, history of the colony, uh, some, you know, later developments in uh, the towns of Plymouth Colony, I just found fascinating. I, I write about um, the minister, Charles Chauncey, who eventually ended up as the president of Harvard, who was temporarily in Plymouth and then was uh, a minister in the town of Situate. And Chauncey, insisted that uh, baptism had to be by uh, dipping, by, by immersion. Just sprinkling somebody with a little water wasn't sufficient. And a number of people in Plymouth and Situate objected to this, especially because it seemed sort of unwise to do that, uh, especially in the winter time. And I really like this little story about a woman named Anna Stockbridge who lived in Situate. And she wasn't going to put up with Chauncey's uh, point of view, but she wanted her daughter to be baptized. So she brought her child to Boston uh, and had someone do it there. So, you know, those sorts of very human stories, um, I think, are really a pleasure to encounter uh, along the way. What you, you talked about um, mentioned persecution and how do, how do you see uh, the position on, on freedom of religion, toleration, persecution uh, that, that occurs in Plymouth as differing from what you would find in some of the other New England colonies? Sure. Well, that's a great question. Well, first of all, there's a lot of clear, there, there's clearly a lot of tension and debate uh, among the leaders and people of Plymouth Colony about the proper bounds of uh, religious toleration. And so there's, you know, there's, it's not, it's not a totally linear uh, story. Um, mm -hmm. You know, my sense is in the early decades, uh, although William Bradford uh, comments at one point that they 
would go around and compel people uh, to as attend Sunday services, I think there was a certain amount of, of latitude. And then there's some laws passed in the early 1650s to compel church attendance uh, and Sabbath observance. But there's clearly a lot, a, a fair amount of resistance uh, to um, that attempt to construct a stricter uh, establishment. Um, the arrival of uh, Quakers and the conversion of some of the settlers uh, to the Society of Friends, uh, that really becomes the defining uh, episode in uh, this debate over the proper bounds of uh, religious toleration. Uh, a number of magistrates who want um, firm punishment of Quakers, they prevail for a couple of years, um, but they eventually, uh, they eventually, I think, are forced to back off because although not that many of the settlers really um, embrace uh, the principles of the Friends, um, they become uh, uneasy about harsh punishment. And they also can see that it's not uh, working. So I think there is, in the end, there is a difference between Plymouth Colony and uh, Massachusetts Bay. It's not just that Massachusetts Bay executes four Quakers and Plymouth Colony doesn't, um, or that, um, you know, in other ways, the Bay Colony is a bit harsher. Uh, there's simply, you know, there are debates about the, the extent of persecution in each colony, and those are resolved a bit differently in, in Plymouth. Mm -hmm. And then especially in the Western part of Plymouth Colony, there's, there's much more um, liberty granted to Baptists and Quakers um, to, to the point that, um, those individuals are not happy about subsequently being incorporated into uh, a larger province of Massachusetts Bay. Yeah. Do you think that there's a certain, um, give, given the strong involvement of the laity in early Plymouth, because you did not have John Robinson, you did not have a clergyman, and so there, there's this element of uh, lay participation. Do, do you think that any of the uh, settlers in Plymouth sort of identified some similar aspects in Quakerism, uh, which basically did away with, formally, with an established ministry? Sure, that's a great question. And you're certainly right uh, to point to the significance of later, lay leadership which I will, I would just say, you also do so marvelously in your book about uh, the Pilgrims and uh, Plymouth Colony. Um, no, definitely. I mean, so the, there is a lot of congruence, really, between separatism um, and uh, the early Quakers. Um, you know, in a sense, you could say that what I talk about in my book as Christian liberty was very important to both groups. Um, that uh, false churches had imposed a yoke of bondage on true Christians through unbiblical uh, ceremonies and, you know, oppressive uh, forms of extra congregational uh, church discipline. And the Quakers, of course, go much farther uh, than the separatists. You know, for instance, they don't just want to get rid of the sign of the cross at baptism. Well, they're going to get rid of baptism as a, as a whole. Um, but, you know, the separatists had been, uh, like many other Puritans, uh, they had been used to being very critical of uh, those ministers who were not genuine preachers of the word. And, you know, they might call them dumb dogs or things like that. Well, you know, the Quakers were more aggressive about it. But when, when they walk into a town and a church and they denounce the minister as ungodly, um, there, there is a little bit of congruence there, um, I think. Um, and certainly there's a willingness on the part of men and women to not defer to 
um, the clergy uh, to think for themselves and to strike out on their own. Yeah. Well, we've talked a little bit about sort of religious liberty. Um, what can you tell us about sort of political liberty as you found it developing in, in early New England with, with the pilgrims, the Mayflower Compact, the way they govern themselves and so forth? Yeah. Well, I'm in the school of thought that, that thinks the Mayflower Compact uh, is really quite remarkable and uh, important. Uh, and that I, I really think it is, it is a landmark, even if it is um, composed hastily uh, under, under pressure of circumstances. So uh, just for the context, when the Mayflower um, reaches Cape Cod, it hasn't reached its intended destination and uh, the passengers don't have a patent to establish uh, a colony and a government in New England. And there's a, a fear, a concern, uh, or maybe even signs that some of the passengers who do not share the separatist principles of the majority, they might just go their own way. And then the, the colony would not have the cohesion and unity that it needed to survive. So they devised this document, um, which um, really, at its core states, not quite in so many words, but if I may paraphrase, mm -hmm. that laws, taxes, and offices, um, the validity of them rests on the consent of the people. Um, and when the pilgrims, uh, not the, maybe the pilgrims isn't the best term then, when later, uh, later on in Plymouth Colony, when the compact is read aloud, uh, that's the way they interpret it. Um, and right after it's signed, they elect a governor for that year and then have annual elections uh, thereafter. So even if there's this brewing uh, mutiny, there are a lot of other ways you could tamp down a mutiny rather than uh, by giving almost all adult men um, the right to vote. I mean, I think that, I think that is, is striking in its inclusivity. Now, going forward, that principle remains important to a lot of uh, the settlers of Plymouth Colony. And, you know, it comes up, for instance, in conflicts over taxation, uh, right toward the very end of the uh, colony's uh, self-governance. At the same time, it's true that as you go forward, a diminishing percentage of male settlers have the right to vote in colony-wide elections and affairs. So, you know, thinking about uh, democracy in Plymouth Colony, which would have been a very dirty word, uh, it, on an ongoing basis, it's not as inclusive as the Mayflower Compact uh, would uh, suggest. Um, at the same time, I think, that, I think that principle, that basic principle of um, consent uh, does remain uh, important to at least many Plymouth Colony settlers. What would you, um, we, I hope, I'm sure you hope that, that many, many people will read your book. Uh, for the non-specialists, what do you hope that they'll come away with in reading your book? How will it shape their understanding of this early period of our history? Well, I guess just at a very basic level, um, I hope that people will find the array of characters and groups both English and native, um, you know, of fascination. And I think that, you know, a gritty encounter with um, humanity in different times and places, that's what really draws me uh, to history. So I, I hope readers will uh, come away uh, with that. And I guess beyond that, you know, I've never really liked morality play versions of history where you have a clearly defined you know, set of uh, saints and a clearly defined uh, mm -hmm. set of sinners. Maybe that works in sometimes uh, in places, you know, like with the Nazis or something like that. Uh, but I don't think it works uh, for the 17th century. And I think if we can move beyond um, you know, such categories, then when I think we have a better chance 
of understanding and appreciating the humanity of the people who were involved um, in this history. Talking about sort of uh, looking at things from a saints and sinners black and white perspective, um, as you've gone through this, uh, how have you filtered in and come to understand uh, the native perspective to this story? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I, I really wrestle with that, um, partly because I think it's very difficult. Um, it would be very almost pretentious for anybody to claim to really understand that perspective well. It's hard enough understanding the English perspective. And at the very least, we can do that through English documents. Uh, when it comes to the native perspective, we're also doing that uh, through um, English documents. Um, there's, there's a verse in the New Testament that I like about you know, the fact that now we see the world through a glass darkly. Um, I think that might be the King James language. And I feel, I feel that I am still viewing um, the world uh, dimly or darkly when it comes to the English perspective. You know, that's, it's, it's a real challenge. So I think as a starting point, I think it's important whether we're writing about history or reading about it uh, to recognize the, the genuine challenges that are uh, involved. With those challenges, we then have to, you know, we then have to do our best to understand the decisions um, that individuals and communities made. Um, so, you know, one of the communities that I enjoyed um, studying uh, for this book what were the um, Sakonets in, you know, what's now Little Compton, uh, Rhode Island, and their leader, Awashanks. Uh, who was a woman uh, who led a community there uh, from at least the early 1670s well into the 1680s. And I came to understand her as really in many ways trapped in an almost impossible position between other native communities uh, that were prepared to fight the English uh, which it seems she really didn't want to do. The other option seemed to be to, um, you know, simply uh, continue on and watch as English settlers, um, in my opinion, you know, bamboozled uh, her people out of their land. Um, you know, so she, you know, she was living through a time period that didn't seem to have didn't seem to have uh, good options. And I think, you know, through the documents that exist, um, I don't know that I can understand her uh, all that well, but I think I, you can get a sense of the, the pincer that she was in and the desperation with which she sought a solution. Uh, in the end, um, no option um, that she chose was really gonna turn out all that well uh, for her. But I ended up just finding her, the, the tenacity of her leadership remarkable, that she was able, at least on some level, to maintain her community uh, for almost two decades amid just incredibly wrenching uh, changes and devastation. You know, I, I, I found that really remarkable. That doesn't, you know, that, that's not necessarily a great answer to your question, uh, Frank, but, but perhaps that's just... That's sort of how I tried to um, wrestle with that reality. Yeah, I, I, I wrestle with the same sort of realities, and that's one of the reasons I asked that. I mean, I, years ago after um, a session in which there was disagreement between me and some uh, current natives uh, over some things, I, I turned to a, a friend, uh, who has dealt a lot with Native history. And one of the things he, he said to me, which I've always borne in mind, is that uh, for us, this is history. Uh, for many of these people, it's current reality. Uh, and that gives them a, a different perspective. But I also like what you said about Ashwangs because uh, I wrote a chapter in a book a number of years ago on John Sassaman, uh, 
And I thought that, that he too is, is someone who is sort of caught in the middle and, and ultimately he is not accepted fully either by Increase Mather and the Christian community of, of Puritans, nor is he accepted by the original native communities. And um, it, it's a tricky thing. And I think it, it gets into this whole issue as well of, of with John Sassaman of, of natives who do convert. And, you know, can we accept that that is a sincere conversion? Uh, and that's something I think that gets very debated. Um, but lots of things for us to think about. Where are you moving next? What, what project are you going to embark upon? Uh, well, I'm actually, I'm, go I'm going back to the Latter-day Saints for, for a bit. So I wrote a biography of Brigham Young a number of years ago. Um, and now I'm writing a biography of Joseph Smith. I have some other things that I want to do on uh, early New England history uh, as well. So I might, I might kind of go back and forth uh, between those two uh, right. for, for a while. Good. Is there anything else you want to tell us about your book before we wrap up? I guess the other thing, uh, one other thing that I'd mention um, that pertains partly to our discussion about um, the relationship between English settlers and natives is, you know, a lot of my book is about English ideas about liberty. Um, but one thing that I emphasize in the book is that I don't think one can do justice to that subject without talking about liberty's starkest opposite, uh, which is slavery. So two, two, of the, two of the things that surprised me when um, researching sort of events toward the end of the Plymouth Colony time period was sort of as you alluded to, uh, the large number uh, of uh, natives who uh, on some level at least uh, embrace and align themselves with Christianity uh, toward the end of the Plymouth Colony time period. And at the same time, uh, the large numbers of natives who are reduced to servitude, uh, which in many instances, I think would be fairly characterized as slavery. And I think, you know, to this day, uh, very few Americans are aware of the general extent of uh, the general significance of slavery in uh, colonial New England, um, and also don't associate uh, slavery with uh, the experiences of uh, Native peoples. Uh, and I, I think that's a really important part of the story that I tried uh, to um, give, you know, significance to in, in my book. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you and uh, hopefully we'll have other opportunities in the future.